Major League Baseball's free agency season opens the day after tomorrow. Are you stoked for this? Good morning to you. Good Tuesday morning. I'm Dan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports. This is the often futile daily shot of Pirates. Comes your way bright and early every weekday if you're into football and or hockey. I also offer daily shots of Steelers and Penguins that I hope you'll check out. Ben Gamble and Roberto Perez are the only free agents to be of any note with this team. Players on the other end of that equation are, of course, as ever, non-existent, certainly in the early portion of the open market. You're just not going to see, I don't believe, ever the Pirates getting aggressive this time of year right off the bat. Where Perez is concerned, as I've been reporting for weeks, I believe there's an understanding between the team and the player for him to come back. I believe it's going to be at a lesser rate than the $5 million that he was paid last season and obviously only played a month before ripping up that hamstring. But I believe that that's... Fate to accompli, I believe, is the term to use. And if it isn't, you know, you can sound really smart by using it at your leisure. I like the idea of bringing Perez back. I have no issue with that. I think he's a perfect stopgap, provided he can stay on the field. And he's had more injury problems than just the one in 2022. But he can be a bridge to get you to Andy Rodriguez and or Henry Davis. And yay for that. Now, Gamel, a little bit of a different story. See, Gamel is that rare, competent veteran who was valued enough by the Pirates to have been kept for an additional year. The problem was that his additional year really didn't pan out to much. Uh, he did play a lot, 371 official at bats. But he batted 232, which is actually, you know, not terrible in the modern perspective as long as you're producing a bunch of pop. But he didn't. There were nine home runs, 46 RBIs, a 693 OPS, nothing there to get excited about. Across the board, uh, below his own career norms, he's been a 253 hitter with a 718 OPS. So what do you do with Gamble? Do you even consider bringing him back? This portion of Daily Shot of Pirates is brought to you by our friends at North Shore Tavern that's directly across Federal Street from PNC Park. It's home of Steak on a Stone, an eating experience, underscoring the word experience. The steak is brought to you partially cooked on an 800-degree stone, and you do the rest. It's a ton of fun, it's a great meal, and it's a baseball atmosphere like no other in Pittsburgh. North Shore Tavern, right across Federal Street from PNC Park. I have two trains of thought as related to Gamble. One is the intangible, and if you're not into that sort of thing, just feel free to skip ahead. <laughs> but I have seen the impact, the positive impact that he's had on younger players. I've seen very specifically the positive impact that he's had for a while now on Brian Reynolds. There's value in that. That's real. It doesn't show up on the back of anyone's baseball card, but the people inside the clubhouse appreciate that. Now, you can very casually dismiss that by saying, well, they lost 101 games and then they lost 100, so can't be all that valuable. And that's true. That's true. But I'm trying to look at this from all perspectives. The other one is you could always use a player who leads by example. And I'd like to think, and I know the players have told me, that the way Gamble lays out for baseballs in the outfield, and sometimes he kind of does that when he doesn't have to, but okay, that's a tone setter. That's something that brings out some personality in a club. Uh, when you see him, I uh, remember the game at Wrigley Field where he was just flying into everything, uh, shy of the brick wall itself. That's the kind of thing that can pick you up and take you to another level. 
in terms of your approach to the game, in terms of the example that you want to put forth. But even if you weigh that and then you weigh modest production for what undoubtedly would be modest pay, what you can't have, what you can't have is him blocking anybody. And this depends largely on how you feel about Jack Sawinski. If you feel that Jack is due a 500 plate appearance season, meaning borderline unconditionally, you just need to see what Jack has. And you're committed to putting him out there on a pretty much full-time basis, which is what it takes to get that many PAs, then you've only got one spot left. Now, if you think of Jack as just another guy in your rotation of corner outfielders, or even if you move Reynolds to a corner spot and you were to use someone like Jiwon Bay in center, well, that gets into counting on Bay to be a regular contributor. I like him, okay, but I'm not ready to anoint him anything. I'm a lot closer to that with Jack than I am with Bay for obvious reasons. You know, Jack's been in the major leagues at least three months longer, and Jack has all those home runs to show for it. So if you throw in on top of that all of your various Cal Mitchell types, and the Pirates do have a bunch of those, you wait until the Rule 5 sorts out the 40-man roster and see who's left, but you've also got Kane and Smith and Ajigba, who's not going to be forgotten by management, even if he's going to have been forgotten by a lot of us because he came up and got hurt right away and was done for the season. But he did make it, and he does have a lot of ability. Now, you also have to throw into the mix that if both Andy and Henry make it, Man, they're not both going to be catchers. I mean, they can tell you whatever it is that they want. They're not both going to be catchers. And if you move Henry out from behind home plate, you're not going to move him to first base, which is your other point of need. And you're definitely not going to have him DH because he's got an 80-grade arm. You're not going to waste that. That means you're going to find an outfield spot for him. So I think I just kind of pushed Gamble off the roster, didn't I? When we come back, J1Q. Today's J1Q comes from John, who asked, Hey, DK, do you like baseball movies? No sport translates to film better than baseball. Natural, Field of Dreams, Sandlot, etc. That would be a fun subject to discuss. I agree, John. I think it would be a fun subject to discuss among people who watch a lot of baseball movies. I'm trying to think of the last movie I've watched. I mean, of any kind. When you're doing multiple podcasts per day, uh, a whole bunch of columns, written columns over the course of the week, traveling around and watching all these games, you're basically sleeping and working. Uh, I don't mean to make that sound like a complaint. I'm beyond privileged to have this job carved it out for myself. If you're familiar with the background of DK Pittsburgh Sports, so I, I'm not about to say, oh, poor me or whatever, but I just don't have time. Uh, of the baseball movies that I've seen, in my life, and again, these go way back. I really thought Moneyball was an honest and fairly accurate representation of Michael Lewis's book. And that's the highest praise I can give it because Lewis's book in and of itself was outstanding. Not just the content, not just for the difference that it made in the game, but just in terms of pure writing, I mean, the guy can just let it fly. And that's that's a gift. So I would put that up there. I, it sounds to me like you're looking more at the, the romantic Kevin Costner types. Uh, and I, I mean, I, I get it, but I, I was 
more interested in eight men out, you know, which you didn't mention that had a, a, you know, a genuine historic reflection as opposed to something that's just made up or cornfieldish. And on that note, I, I feel this is a good opportunity to share with you that how completely absurd is it that nobody's ever done like the definitive Roberto Clemente film? Is it because, uh, you know, that Hollywood would fear the sad ending? You know, I, I don't know. I mean, there's a way to do that. Uh, for those of you who've seen Gandhi, and I'm obviously going way back, it was a three-hour epic, but the Gandhi movie began with the ending. And for those of you who've seen it, it it's the only movie that I can recall that ever really being like that, where they, they opened up with his assassination. So you didn't have to spend the entire film dreading the ending. You could just now focus and concentrate on the beautiful story overall that went into it. If you were to do something similar with Clemente, you opened up the movie with, you know, the tragedy at the end, you know, everybody just helping him load up that plane and everything else. And the plane goes off in the distance. You don't have to show anything. You don't have to get graphic, but you get it out of the way. There's no suspense. There's no, is he going to make it for anybody who doesn't know the story or anything like that? And now you just appreciate who he was, what he did and how much he meant to so many. How, how has the ultimate sports story, or at least one of them, over the course of the past century and a half, not been put to film. That makes no sense to me. Hollywood is always talking about how desperate they are for scripts and, and acknowledging how people appreciate more when they're seeing a depiction of something that was real or even something that was close to what was real. And yet this story just sits there untold in a celluloid format. Uh, yeah, that'll be the next one I see. How about that for an answer, John? I'll go see the Clemente movie. I appreciate the question. I appreciate everyone listening to Daily Shot of Pirates. We'll do another one of these tomorrow. Mm-hmm.